All right, let's do it. We're there. We're there. This thing's on. It's on. It's recording. It's recording. Oh, that whole thing. Oh, good grief. Yeah, I can even see the little waveform drawing out on the screen from You're here. You're not gonna blackmail me, right? <laughs> well, you shouldn't have told that story. Oh, good grief! You know. <laughs> anyway, hi, folks. Hey, how's it going? It's Paul and Grace. Back for uh, week uh, week thirty five. No. Thirty. This is conversation thirty one. Thirty one. Back yeah. in thirty one. Yeah. So this is um, what is it? <clears throat> Uh, February 11th? It's February 11th, 2018. 20, 2018. Mm-hmm. So, let's yeah. jump right into it. Walk a week. Walk a week. There there was there was no walk. There, there was, was no walk. We had quite a blizzard, though. We did. Nine inches in one day. Yeah, it was... Um, so, uh, this started uh, Thursday night. Thursday night. And snowed pretty much round, round the, the clock, clock through Friday... And, and then on into Saturday morning a bit. And on into Saturday morning a bit with another like couple inches on Saturday. Yeah. And um, I actually, I didn't stay home from work exactly. I you got attempted. up. <laughs> you attempted to work. I got up on Friday and I headed out. I got to uh, the merge from uh, 23 North to 94 West. Yeah. And that's just to be clear, that's, that's what, that's less than five miles from my house. That's, that's. <laughs> I think that's about a mile and a half from our house. Yeah, it's it's pretty close. Yeah. And that uh, entrance was completely backed up, and all these emergency vehicles were getting on, and you could see from the ramp that mm-hmm. traffic was... Stopped cold. Stopped cold, and uh, there's all this stuff going on. So I got out, no of, I got out of line and uh, got back on 23 uh-huh. and drove to... The uh, Washtenaw exit at 23, got off, went to get gas and consider my next move and listen to the radio a bit. I heard that 94 was stopped. It's closed. It, it, it actually was closed completely at Ann Arbor Saline Road due to right. a massive accident. Yep. Um, and then, so I got gas. I texted my boss saying, yeah, I, I, think, I'm, I think I'm not going to try and drive through town. You know, the freeway's closed. It's not looking too good. And the snow's coming down very heavily. And more importantly, I, you know, I can get around right now. But in eight hours, it's supposed to continue snowing this whole time. Right. In eight hours, I might just be <clears throat> completely stuck somewhere. I might not right. be able to get out of my office parking lot without just a tow or something. Yeah, something ludicrous. You know? Right. And I certainly wouldn't be the only one needing a tow. Right. Or a push or whatever or something i don't right. know I even know what i would do but um yeah it wasn't good so and then i was listening to the radio on the way home and i heard as soon as i shortly after i was off 23 right i heard that they closed 23 as well yeah due to yeah. a big crash at the washington <laughs> exit <laughs> so like all, all these people are going into work for jobs where you know I'm sorry, I, I should say, actually, important. actually, traffic was fairly light. Traffic was light. Well, that's yeah. good. That's good. Yeah. But there's still so, all these accidents. There were still, but there was a very high ratio of accident to car. Yeah. And in fact, later in the day, I learned, you know, not only had there been several massive, like, 10 car pileups, yeah. but at least one fatality, least one fatality. on 94. And I, just, just to be clear, what I was getting at is I don't think... All these people were first responders and medical professionals on the road. Yeah, it's. I'm certain they weren't all, uh, you know, going to the hospital. If you have a a job such that you know you're a life saving person, mm-hmm. uh, you know, you being at your job literally is a matter of life and death for people. You know, Godspeed. You do what you got to do. Do what work. you got to got to do. Mm-hmm. Um, but I don't. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, you know, I mean, whether I finish a project might affect a schedule and, and a budget and whatnot, but Maybe. it's literally, it's not a, it's a, little, it's a matter, matter of life, life and death. death. No. It's, it's just, <clears throat> so I, I picked up some fire logs. Yep. Good move. A, and um, made my way very slowly back mm-hmm. home. There was just, a Carpenter was just uh, emergency vehicles mm-hmm. everywhere. Mm-hmm. You know, it was just, it was re- It was a mess. The driving conditions were very poor. Um, yeah. But I made it home fine and uh, 
we basically resigned ourselves to being snowbound for a while. And it was fun. It was good. It was fun. It, we watched uh, some classic Doctor Who, and we'll talk about that. Yeah. In, in a, well, it, actually, that's not entirely fair that we did not get a walk in. I walked the baby a quarter mile up our driveway. That's true. <laughs> After yeah. we came home from mass, we got stuck in the driveway. So we we <laughs> didn't, yeah we we didn't get out Friday, and we did get out on Saturday for right. a while. For a little while, we did make it out to mass. It was very difficult, even getting the four wheel drive truck out of our driveway. Yep. And uh, then on the way back, it, we were stuck right in the driveway off of Crane Road, which yeah. is a quarter mile long. Mm-hmm. So yeah, and. The baby was howling. The baby was fussing. So Grace just took the baby and started walking up the road. And right. I stayed in the car with the kids and, and worked to try and get it unstuck. Worked magic, getting it unstuck. Yeah. So we have this we have this Tahoe, uh, kind of an older Tahoe. Mm-hmm. And uh, honestly, it's been pretty reliable. It really it's has. a little tight as far as fitting any groceries in with the kids. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Actually, comical. <laughs> it's comically tight. How little you know? How little room there is in this huge car. But I've never quite gotten the hang of using the four wheel drive low and high and the different modes. Yeah. Um, partly because let's say you are out driving on a road and you know you want to put it in like four wheel low. Right. Well, like to switch modes to put it in four wheel low, you have to get up some speed, a little speed. The then you have to put it in neutral, neutral. and coast for a while. Under and 15 miles an hour. Under 15 miles an hour while switching Same. modes, or it won't modes. work. It won't work, yeah. Or it just, like, stays, it just... And you have to do this before you are in the situation where you Where need. you're going to be stuck. Right. Which is actually, it basically means you can't do it in traffic or while you're driving, or everyone will be like, what the hell? What's going on? <laughs> right? Yeah, you can't just slow down to 15, 15 miles an hour and 40 miles coast, an hour. Coasting, you know, Coasting like, and... Switching yeah. gears. Well, it's I'd, very da- it's, it would be very dangerous it also, to do that. It means you have to like anticipate <sighs> needing four wheel drive right. or whatever whatever right. like special feature it is. You have to anticipate yeah. well in advance. So the normal mode of the thing is like auto four wheel drive, where it's not like I don't even know what it is. It's not fully four wheel drive, but it will divert power to the other wheels. Yeah, but it, um, it's, but it it. If you actually are stuck in snow, mm-hmm. going to like full, fully on four wheel drive low, right, it works much better. Yes, um, but yeah, it's hard to get into that so if you're, you're stuck. stuck in the snow. Especially if you're stuck, you can't get up to speed and coast to get it right. into that mode. So it's like, so mm-hmm. we spent a good twenty minutes just getting out, the just door. kidding, getting out of the driveway. We so we got on the road and then I turned around and came back so I could go find a an empty parking lot that was big enough and empty enough to where I could get up to the right speed and coast and get it into the normal uh, gear, right? Yeah. Anyway. And coming I, back, yeah, it was just kind And of coming absurd. back it was laughable. I had to do some pretty uh extreme maneuvers. R- some revving and, you know, jamming it in gear and and the kids were very, very entertained. They're like, Dad is the greatest <laughs> driver. <laughs> <laughs> but I like kids are cheering I want, when they get out of the oh, car. There's another little detail, which is that the gear indicator is completely burned out. Oh yeah, so you, so you can only right. shift by feel. Yeah, you like kind of have to. you have to remember where the gears are. So I'm trying to put it in neutral, and actually just suddenly like jamming it into reverse instead, what? and then the thing, you know, Works it's it's computer controlled. So even oh. if you even if you like, let's say you're going. 70 and jam it in reverse it's not gonna like suddenly all the gears are gonna explode or explode whatnot that's not gonna happen it knows that it can't do that right so it's gonna Good. it's gonna like slow down and then try and reverse you it doesn't do anything that dramatically when but you still. when you if you do it wrong mm-hmm. so you can't actually like well i hope you can't really blow up the transmission that way but um, yeah, we'll I was wound soon. up jamming it into the wrong gear, and because we hardly ever use the four wheel low, when we put it in four wheel low and start going, it's like going, 
it's making all these grinding noises. It sounds like a giant pencil sharpener. <laughs> yeah, maybe it is. Maybe they, maybe they accidentally installed a pencil sharpener. It's full of metal shavings or something <laughs> where the gears used to be. It was yeah. It doesn't sound good. But uh, hopefully it after still drives. It's it was fine after we put it. Anyway, we've discovered we're going on and on about this, but we've discovered that on light snow, forcing it into two wheel only yeah. is best. Right. And on heavy snow or deep snow or wet snow, getting it all the way into four wheel low is best. Okay. But the uh, like the auto on demand thing it doesn't. It's just regular is, driving. It's worse. Yeah. It's just regular driving. Yeah. It doesn't do anything in the other situations. Yeah. So, yeah. So that was that was our walk. Mommy that was our walk was. Mommy but, and Eleanor. Yeah, we off got the to driveway. we got to mass anyway. Well, so we'll come back to that when we talk about our, our special meal. So, oh yeah, yeah. But, um, yeah, we, we're grateful to have a car that actually turns has been over. pretty reliable. Starts, yeah. turns over, and gets us places. The thing, the the downside of it is, if it does have a some repair with it, with the this complex drivetrain it's, it's very sad differential everything in there Just, this, yeah. if it does need work it's always like it's always it's like twenty five hundred dollars it's Ka-ching. bam yeah which is why it's like that anyway yeah <laughs> anyway. get you coming and going it is a, a planned and wanted source of revenue for the, uh, the dealerships. Anyway, so what are, what are we watching? What are you reading? We're not we're not really reading anything just now. You have a book you haven't finished. I'm still working my way through uh, this David Brin novel. Oh yeah, the one with the dolphins. Or yeah, the- <laughs> fortunately we've left the dolphins behind for a while. Okay. hopefully a long while. But you're about eighty percent. So, Seventy five, okay. eighty. So so I'm gonna finish it. It's just. It's just taken me forever. So, are you thinking this is getting you time out of purgatory, or well, what's the what's the plan here? I I don't think it makes me a better person. I think it's really insisting on finishing it is really just a sign of personal weakness, honestly. Oh, oh yeah. Well, <laughs> it's that. probably the sin of pride or something. Yeah, it's probably some kind of sin. But I'm, I'll finish it, and then and then the good news is I've got lots of more interesting, shorter things piled up to read. So, oh, so you get the reward of better things to read that's, when you finish this. That's one. kind of it. Like so, yeah. You'll get pudding after you finish your meat. Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. That's good. That's good. But I'm hoping that the, that the, the this is the thing. If you read science fiction, you often have to sacrifice quality of writing because you love uh, the big ideas. The big ideas, yeah. I, I mean, it's really true. A lot of science mm-hmm. fiction just is not that well written, and you're reading it more for the interest of the the author's um, futurism, you know. Or right. uh, uh, and this is an example of that. I just hope that by the time I get to the end, the big ideas are it was big. Are big, yeah. Because uh, a novel like a novelist like Phil Dick mm-hmm. could write, "Do androids dream of electric sheep?" Which is like, it's like two hundred pages. Not that big. It's not that long a novel. It's very not that tight. Long, it's, yeah. very, it's very tight a story. But the ideas are huge. But the ideas are huge. He had like little, little throwaway ideas that are mm-hmm. just sort of background plot, right. background devices that aren't even things the plot hinges on. They're that like, could whoa. be the subject of stories themselves, right. you know. Right. Anyways, so yeah, so so you uh, can do that. Well, let's, let's talk about science fiction that's not quite in that category. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right. So, uh, this, do you want to introduce this part? It's old time Doctor Who. Yeah, yeah. It's I, yeah. I just, I have to confess, I never enjoyed the old Doctor Who. It's, like like it all. I'd come home if I'd come home from school, it'd be on PBS and I would like groan and turn the channel. I'd like get up and go turn the channel <laughs> because it just it, yeah. There was a when I was had a, my so first bad. girlfriend back when I was twelve years old or so, I would go over to her house, we'd visit uh, mm-hmm. on Sundays or whatnot. And her sister would be watching PBS mm-hmm. and on PBS would be Tom Baker episodes of of Doctor Who, the yep. Fourth Doctor. I I think there were reruns at that point, but I'm not In, positive. I'm not sure either. I think they no. I don't. I think these were. They might have just been syndicated, like I think it was syndicated. from the previous season or something. Yeah, they weren't too. too it wasn't too far away from no, when they no, were broadcast. But um, and I was intrigued by Doctor Who. I loved the title effects. You know, yeah, the title was kind of cool. The music. And yeah, yeah. 
and I'd be like, oh, what's this about? And I'd like, oh, the story looks interesting. And then I'd watch it and my jaw would kind of be hanging open. And after a while, I'd be like, wow. This is bad. This is terrible. <laughs> and there's a few ways in which it's parti- that that it's bad that I think you should differentiate it from just bad in some other way. Right. And one of the ways is that almost every episode of the old serial is very, very padded. Yes, there's a lot of just right from empty the get go. Yeah. Yeah, just nothing. And I, it's hard to understand why they kept doing that. Yeah, more of this, more of like, the padding, more padding. Like all the episode, all the serials had to be like four parters, and or, yeah. and they just didn't have enough material. Story material. They barely had enough material for one. For one or two. Yeah. yeah. I mean, two if you were, yeah. two if you really were, wanted to flush it out. And then even just, if they did have reasonable story material and dialogue, they would, they would always split up. It was just a thing that they did constantly. Is you have to split up the companion from the doctor. Yeah. So that you can intercut. For no reason. Probably the reason being that they could shoot them separately. And then they would just intercut their stories back mm-hmm. and forth. And you'd often wind up cutting away from a story that was getting interesting just to see the companion doing something that was completely Nothing. uninteresting for five minutes. Nothing at all. Walking and, or, or the other way. Yeah. There's a there's a series of books that are reviews of the old school Doctor Who. They're called Running Through Corridors. Yeah. Because so much of the old <laughs> show. Just running through corridors and screaming. Running through corridors, screaming. And, and then you cut back... <sighs> And then you cut back, and the other person's running through a corridor, you Screaming. know. So, yeah, the pacing is a problem. And, yeah. and I keep... The pacing, the padding. I scratch my head a bit because I think, you know, is it just that our attention span is shorter nope. than it was back then? Like, nope. no, it wasn't. I've watched plenty of old films. Oh, yeah. That have a slower... Uh, feel. Feel, Yeah. And international films and foreign and films fine. and all, they're and fine. they're fine, even Some if little. they move slowly. Right, if no. there's something artistic and of interest happening yeah, on the screen, it can be slow paced. Mm-hmm. It's fine, but this is all just padding. It's and just then, padding, it's, and it's just bad. And yeah, another aspect is the cheapness of the sets. Although you know, that's okay. If you've got if you've got William Shatner, you can have cheap sets. That it gives you a little insight into why Shatner acted Kirk the way he did. Yeah, so you weren't paying attention to the wall falling apart so behind you, him. Yeah, so you could have these dramatic scenes, right? And didn't and not bust out laughing when Spock is thrown to the ground and his head actually tears through the wall, which is made of styrofoam. Which yeah, card, it's cardboard or Card- whatever. <laughs> right. But um, so yeah, I mean you can. And occasionally, it's like you Kirk can would be call f- it out with like Spock's superhuman strength. Yeah. <laughs> like what? what? Well, this is looking pretty stupid. Let me tear my shirt off. Yeah, how about that? <laughs> <laughs> See, then Doctor Who didn't have any of that. No. So you know. So so not enough is happening to distract you from the cheap sets. But yeah, you know you're right. You you can have cheap sets and really still can. have an enjoyable show. Right. And then, but then there's also just that often the dialogue wasn't that good, and the story oh, wasn't, wasn't that, that good. good. And it, occasionally it, they had some ideas, right? They yeah, had an idea, yeah, and the idea was pretty good. Yeah, like, but you know, it was it was a five minute idea. Yeah, it was a movie short. It was just a little brief, like kernel of an idea, and instead they drug it out into four episodes over four weeks for no reason i mean like did they maybe the reason was they had to have an episode like they had a quota to fill so they were just churning out what they could churn out well it sounds kind of uncomfortably familiar doesn't it oh yeah maybe it does wait Uh, hold on (laughs) yeah well, anyway, it, for for various reasons, uh, people remember them fondly from yes. their childhood because they were the first monster movie they saw or the right. first science fiction. And they, they, and they saw, grew up to love monster movies. Which they is, grew yeah. up to love this show beca- and they remember it fondly. And I think probably in many cases they remember it as being better than it was. Certainly. Yeah. Well, and they for for whatever reason, and I think this is actually cultural. Uh huh. I think people Doctor Who has a lot of tropes in it. 
yeah. that kind of fly over the heads of people that aren't part of the culture. Yes. Right. And um, well, it also was it was what everybody on the playground was talking about, was talking about the it. next day. So right. you had to watch it so you could talk with your buddies about it. Right. Even if you had to watch it from behind the couch. Right, know? which many people did. Yeah. Right. So that actually adds to the experience and changes the nature of what you experienced watching it. When it's communal. When it's communal. Sure. Right? Yeah. Um, so that's that's also happening. And none of that is present or part of what you and I were watching in the right. 70s and 80s. We were 80s, just seeing just bits. Like, of, we were coming in in the middle of a serial trying to pick up the story and enjoy it. And enjoy it. And, it really and there just wasn't enough there. Wasn't enough there. Whereas yeah. it was like, basically it's a sketch that people then riffed off of together and enjoyed together. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And that's that's actually lovely and cool. Yeah. And I think it's those shared memories that brought us the current Doctor Who, which is much more enjoyable. I think that's true. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Um, that said, we watched these two series while we, we were we've uh, been, holed up. We've been watching serials that are that I actually downloaded from a fan site where people post fan edits. Yes. And these are quasi-legal Quasi legal, but very good. In that, in that, your um, the idea is if you own the the DVDs, you can right. download this fan edit and watch it, and you're not really stealing anything. Oh right, right. But it's quasi legal. They right. they're tolerated, I guess. You know. Well, you know, it certainly drives up sales. <sighs> yeah, I, I think it it does. Right. I mean, we have a, a, you know, we don't own every old episode. Right, but we do have a ton of the new ones. We have shelf feet of Doctor Who DVDs, honestly. Right. So we we picked two. Uh, we, we we've watched a few more than two, but I wanted to mention two. Right, one was Power of the Daleks. One was Power of the Daleks. That was actually really pretty good. It was animated. Yes. Well, here's how that came about. So mm-hmm. a lot of large numbers of the episodes from back in the day, the BBC didn't really have rights to rerun them. Right. And wasn't going to be able to make any money off showing them again. Mm-hmm. So just do this practice, this routine practice of junking the tapes. Just throw the tape out. They, or wipe them and actually reuse, reuse them. them. for other things. <laughs> because <laughs> tape is expensive. Right. It's hard to imagine in 2018. 2018 that you could get all this crew and cast and everyone together and make this show and with all this effort away. and show it once and then throw, throw it away. It away. But yeah. um, but that happened. Now, the BBC has been trying to recover. They stopped this in like 77 or something. They mm-hmm. stopped junking episodes, and they started an effort to get lost episodes back. And they're, they do exist in some mm-hmm. form or another. Um, they exist in audio tapes that people recorded right off the TV. Right. People there, they could say, of course, I'll yeah. record it. It's coming on. So the audio exists for mm-hmm. every episode. Uh, yeah. They exist in the form of copies that were distributed to overseas English stations mm-hmm. that showed it. Um, okay. People made t- oh, telescene recordings that literally, literally film off of the TV, TV. screen. Um, there are a variety of ways. I just want you to stop for a second. I want you to imagine the family that is that nerdy. They're filming the television set. Yes. Episodes of Doctor Who. Some of them okay. really were done that way right. by families. Right. Those were mostly the audio recordings. So. Right, okay. But the the telescenes were like, that was an official way of preserving. Oh, yeah. okay, yeah. They over Because the thing ran for so many years, mm-hmm. uh, it went through whole generations of different technology from black and white through color mm-hmm. and all this, and all so these on. different, right. but anyway. So there are there these, there these stills. Many of, yeah, there's... There are snaps, telesnaps. Right. Most of the episodes, they have snaps of every scene, like snapshots of every scene. Right. Um, And so there's something to reconstruct. But this episode, this serial that we watched, um, Power of the Daleks, Uh is actually the second Doctor's first episode. Mm-hmm. First complete episode after, so as he's like regenerated. After he's yeah, after he's regenerated into the second Doctor, right? Um, and it does not exist in. There is no video or film of the show, right? Or but it has the audio and the there are photos. audio and photos, and that's it. Mm-hmm. And so this one was reconstructed using animation. Wow! Yeah, and, and they really captured the Doctor well. I thought it was. Uh, that's the thing that's so weird. You'd expect this to be even more cheesy or more no. stupid. No, it was actually really quite dramatic. Well done. 
quite dramatic, well done, and makes, you know, I, I believe, so there's two things at work. One is that the artwork, the fact right. that everything was done a little more abstractly using artwork, mm-hmm. somehow reduced the distractions of the low budgetness of it. Yes. Like, if you have just these, um, the backgrounds drawn for the show, mm-hmm. don't look cheesy. Right, because everything's drawn. Because everything's drawn. <laughs> right, everything's a drawing. Right. right. And the other, the, the, the second aspect of it is that this was the fan edit of the release, mm-hmm. which means that uh, some very diligent fans took the DVD release of the animated version mm-hmm. and deleted like a third of it delete all the trash right and cut it rearranged and trimmed it to make it more dramatic and give it more pacing and actually in some cases i think they even added different musical cues to different scenes to sort of heighten the drama of certain i mean think of it this way think of it like you know you've been really sick for a while and you're not your best self yeah and someone like let's say maybe it's your aunt or somebody who really loves you, like your aunt's you're your aunt's favorite nephew. Right. And she's a hairdresser and she's like, Oh, I'm just gonna bathe you and trim you up and when she's done you look fantastic. You look fabulous. You, you look got fabulous. A new suit. You got a new suit and everything. Yeah. Right? That's yeah. what that's what this is. Yeah. So someone who really cares about Doctor Who. More than is rational. More than it's rational. <laughs> exactly. Just like your aunt that thinks you're the best ever. Yeah, yeah. More than, no, she has more than rational love and care for you. Right. <clears throat> she takes her best skills, and she's a professional hairdresser, right? Yes. Professional barber. And she does her best effort on your appearance and buys you the finest looking clothes. That's what these fans have done for this yes. episode. So, like they say, show it in the best possible the light. The best possible light. Yeah. Taking all the stuff that really... Just didn't need to be there. It didn't add to the didn't experience. Didn't add anything. And some things that detracted. Just and they have to be pretty... Um, pruned all that Pretty way. vicious, yes. honestly, yes. To, to really to make it flow well. And here's the thing. Yeah. Many times, for me, watching the old Doctor Who, you never... At least for me, I could never figure out what the hell's going on. No. Like, what? what's even happening? People are just <laughs> moving around talking about what? I can't even tell. Well, especially the way they would just... They would so because they had such a low budget. They would very often mm-hmm. put the menacing thing off screen, right? And so you would have an awful lot of scenes where someone's you know running down a corridor, and they come to a, a turn or something, and they turn around, and then they see something, and it's clearly horrible, and so they like flash a light or something, and then the person's eyes bug out and they, they scream. scream. And you're watching it. And you're, like, you're like, what the? F- what just happened? Because the, the, nothing the, happened. They can't show it to you because they don't have a thing to right. show you. Where it wasn't in the budget. This fan edit really had great dramatic pacing. Was actually terrifying and menacing, menacing in many 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 places. This was the best version of the Daleks. The most yeah. scary version of the Daleks of all, all the Dalek stuff that I've seen in the old. Doctor Who. And scarier than some of the new and Doctor scarier Who. And scarier than a lot of the new Doctor Who. Yeah, honestly. And there were these sequences where the Daleks are just like, they've been cooped up in this spaceship that's been mm-hmm. recovered for, I don't know, a thousand years or so, whatever, whatever the yeah. plot said. And um, they're barely just coming to life. Right. And so the camera, even you know, for, of, of this animated thing, mm-hmm. kind of lingers on the Dalek and it like very slowly starts to move. And it really works as an animated show yeah. yeah it worked it, it was it was very impressive so yeah so actually scary actually dramatic and i could tell what was the story happening. was what was happening yes. like and that's i think is actually my biggest critic critique of the old show you could not follow the plot one thing it had nothing to hang on to nothing nothing in this was there for, as far as plot in this serial the doctor has just regenerated mm-hmm. and he's supposed to be completely spacey Right, because he's only half aware of what he's doing. He's confused. He Who actually, he is, his brain is still working. He's figuring out what needs to happen. Mm-hmm. But in a lot of the scenes, he just seems completely bumbling. Right, and that was deliberate, though. Right, because it was establishing that you know even freshly you know freshly minted it, with his brain not fully rebooted he's right. still like you know Sharp processing right. processing <laughs> he's still sharper up the to save doctor. the planet yeah right. yeah so we would hi- i we would both highly recommend this yeah. 
the second doctor the it's fan edit the fan edit of power of the daleks of power of the daleks really it's, worth it's watching really good and it's also it's also a great um it's also a great piece of propaganda i'd say yes, yes. Um, it's it's uh not my kind of propaganda yeah. but it's it's a great piece of propaganda really well done to sort of plant ideas in your head yeah do you, yeah. you want to elaborate on that at all or? so the so the plot is there's a revolution being staged yes and the so some people are trying to trying to use the Daleks as uh, as a weapon. As a weapon. This idea was used later mm-hmm. in the new series. Yes. I remember in the one with Churchill and the Daleks. Oh right, yes. Where the the Daleks were being used by the Allies as a as a tool, as a, of, a as war, tool of war, and they the were the servants. And so they right. they show up, and the doctors freaked out because the Daleks here is like, "Would you like a, a cup, cup of tea?" tea? It's hilarious. That's not okay. But I think that that modern one yeah. was a callback to this old Without one. Without question. Yeah, because the Daleks are, in this one, the Daleks are saying, we are your servants. And uh, and there's this really creepy character who's, who's also like a, a like a mad like a mad doctor, a mad scientist yeah, character, yeah. who ends up uh, trying to avail himself as a servant of the Daleks to save his own life. Right. But the deal is, the revolutionaries are the bad guys in this uh-huh, story. Uh-huh. And, uh, and you're thinking, oh, the revolutionaries should be the good guys. <laughs> <laughs> but basically, it's, it's you know, you don't rise up against the British Empire. Yeah, it's, a, it's, an anti- it's a colonialist kind of thing. Right. It's, it's yeah. basically a pro-colonialist, pro-colonialist yeah, yeah, thing. Yeah, it is a bit. Yeah. yeah. So, so. That, that's very interesting. I just, yeah. you know, so I'm always looking for that. Right. Okay, so, that, so I'll include a link to that fan edit. And I presume that you can still download it, but just a warning: it's not official. It's not necessarily completely legal. It could go right. away at some point. But yeah. uh, if you want to support, you know, the BBC, I would say don't buy the old ones just so you can watch the fan edit. Buy some new ones. Buy some new ones. Yeah. <laughs> buy the David Tennant shows. Yeah, those were good. I'm a big fan of Eccleston, but that's I'm Eccleston, a minority we, in that. We enjoyed too. <coughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, the other one we watched was, you know, there were some things about this I really liked. I'll just give it. I, I really like some of these things. This one was more troubling. Yeah, the Happiness Patrol. The Happiness Patrol. And we watched. We watched the end of it. We watched a fan edit, but we suffered through the first um, two thirds of it in um, full in length, full glory, full length form in color. Um, and, and like I said, I think they should keep the wigs. The wigs were <laughs> breathtaking. These sort of like day glow pink and red and yeah. lavender well, let, let wigs. Tell, well, let, well, when we get to the end, we'll, I'll tell you my theory about what I think they should really do with the reconstruction. But, okay. But. So this is uh, this is actually also a critique and a bit of propaganda against uh, Thatcher Thatcherism. England. Thatcherism. Yeah. And this one actually apparently got the BBC like... Uh, in, in trouble? In trouble. Oh, yeah. Investigated for, for you know, anti-government uh, propaganda Panda. which is only right and just oh, only right and just so this uh so the doctor's companion come to this planet and there's what um it's it's supposed to be a city it's actually all shot indoors on the sound stage yep but it's very dark and grim it's kind of a totalitarian looking state you yep. know like something you'd expect in a dramatization of 1984 yeah yeah, mm-hmm. except that there are these um, roving bands of women with hot pink wigs. Yeah, who, and guns. And guns. Mm-hmm. And their job is, uh, if they find anyone looking dour or grim... Or unhappy. Or unhappy, to cheer them up by killing them. <laughs> oh, you know, to make them not unhappy. To make them not unhappy. Exactly. Yeah. And, you know, and everyone, just, you know... To ensure that everyone is happy, they have public executions Fusions. of these people. People who are unhappy. And they execute them by covering them with... Uh, by drowning them in candy. By drowning them in, like, liquid what is it, fondant. Yeah, um, well, like you know... Hot sugar. Hot sugar, yeah. yes. It's demented, kind actually. Of demented. <laughs> actually, quite demented. And everybody, everybody and his brothers is waiting to rat you out. And everybody and his brother wants to be ratted out just to end it right there, there's a guy whose job is to go around and chat up people on park benches like a yeah. guy in a bowler who's mm-hmm. you know oh like, hey friend how's it going and then yeah, there's a definite gay subtext going on in this show it, it pops up in several oh, different ways okay yeah but that the like the guy the the middle-aged gentleman of befriending you on the park bench is is an example of that oh, right yeah mm-hmm. but then you know 
he reveals himself to be actually an undercover agent of the Happiness, Happiness Patrol. Patrol right. right. And, but like he's like, hey, you want to join the revolution, kid? Here's yeah. my car. <laughs> you know? Yes. And he blows a whistle on you. <laughs> yeah, right, right. It's, uh, it wasn't that long ago in London mm-hmm. that being homosexual was a criminal offense. You know, oh, that yeah. like being out on a park bench, you know, meeting uh, meeting men for activities was it could get you in jail, in jail. Yeah. yeah yeah um so i think that's that's the subtext there yeah but there's it has some good things going for it no it it did it did have some good things go well first of all this idea of criticizing the state is always good yeah. right yeah i'm there for that um <clears throat> now the, the, the critique which, of thatcherism too yeah i was there for that yeah um the satirical elements. Yeah. Well, and The Candyman was great. The Candyman is a whole, you know, someone could write a book about The Candyman. I'm candy thinking there's man. a dissertation waiting to happen with The Candyman. My man. God, The Candyman. So, you want to describe The Candyman? So, The Candyman is actually made up of uh, Bassett's all sorts. He's got like a, a non pariah head and then like the yellow licorice body. No, yeah. he's got the yellow licorice legs. What's his body? The, the body, okay, so his hips are like a big yellow all sort with a big. Uh, um, black licorice center, which looks a little bit uh, slightly obscene, honestly. It's suggestive, yes. Yeah, but then his body is like a hard candy shell, like a big root beer barrel or something. Oh, right. Like, the, oh, those are strawberry ones? Yeah. Yeah. And then his arms and legs are made up of like segmented pieces of hard candy. Hard candy, right. Yeah. But he, so yeah, his head is this eyes. giant licorice, all sorts candy, the blue. The blue ones. And he has little spirals for eyes. He's got like spatulas for cheeks. Yeah. Little spirals for eyes. And as he stares at you, they're spinning. Yeah. It's absolutely demented. Yeah, really, really off the rails. And he's a candy man. He's the executioner. He's the executioner. Right. His body is covered with plastic tubing. Apparently, his innards are made of liquid molasses and fondant Fondant and and caramel. But uh, what's that, mascarpone? Not the... Oh, gosh. Marzipan. Uh, Marzipan. Yeah. And he even describes, it, oh, it's all just sort of swirling Swishing around out. in there. Like, Ew. Ew. You know. This is but really he, gross. He, he speaks in this really shrill voice yep. and threatens people with death by candy. And yeah, it's just, he's, you can't, I'll say this, while he's on screen, you literally cannot take your eyes off of him. <laughs> it's like, What? What's happening here? And he's funny, but but it's so over the top that, again, kind of your jaw's hanging open a bit. Like, who wrote this? Who thought this up? Yeah. See, now, but now, I think the image of the candy man, I don't, I don't think yeah. he should actually be candy. I think that's yeah, actually a made problem. of candy. I don't think he should be made of candy. No. But this guy that, I mean. He could have been a candy chef. Right, because it's a metaphor. Yes. For hard drugs. Yes. For feeding people, people hard drugs, what they want, right. you know, which is going to kill them. To kill them, right. Yeah. Um, and that, you know, the people who do that are actually executioners. Great metaphor. We should yes. hold on to that. Yes, But yes. The, can- the guy who's actually made out of candy. <laughs> I looked it up, and apparently the original suit, the original candy <laughs> suit, recently yeah. went up for auction, as in just a, cu- a few years ago, a couple of years right. ago. And I saw pictures of what it looked like couple mm-hmm. years ago and it had unfortunately deteriorated a lot oh. because it was made of foam which doesn't right it doesn't last well it doesn't all. hold up well if it's stuck in a trunk for 20 years or yeah, 30 years 30 years um but yeah uh it did sell still sold for sold for like three thousand pounds or three thousand yeah. dollars yeah it's 1500 pounds yeah but like time. so somebody could buy that and there are people who specialize in restoring kind of costumes yeah Someone could do an amazing job restoring this costume, and so some person with more disposable income than <laughs> than we have could have this thing basically recreated, stuffed, and mounted in their family room. Is like, oh, that, that's the original that's candy, candy man. man. That would be boss. that would be that would be fun. Oh my that would god! Be fun. Even though it was stupid in the show, yeah. Right. It's, so it's is iconic though. Well, no, and actually, what were you saying that they? Um, they actually didn't use the Candyman again because um, there was a. Uh, he looks a lot like Bassett's uh, mascot. There's a. There's a. Um, what's the word? Mascot. Yeah, like for, a mascot. For or... for Bassett's licorice, all sorts. Mm-hmm. 
I forget what his name is. It's yeah, like, I don't know his name. But he looked very much like the kid. Yeah, his, the, he was also built out of all sorts, and he looked very similar. But uh, mm-hmm. So they didn't actually sue. There wasn't actually a lawsuit. But the BBC had to write the Bassett's company a letter saying, okay, we won't use the we'll Candyman again. again. Sorry. Right. You know. like, and I, I can see how that could be seen as infringement on their brand. Yes. I honestly don't think it was intentional, but, you know. <clears throat> but, you know, may reflect poorly on them to think right. that, you know, their mascot's right. an executioner. So I have to say that I, watching The Candyman, mm-hmm. I developed an intense craving for blue licorice all sorts <laughs> of the type, a craving the likes of which I have not experienced in many years. Right. No, you were... I think you went to what four seven seven, seven I went to seven different stores on my lunch break. I went to three different stores, and then after work, I went to like four more, looking for licorice all sorts. Yeah, no one seemed to have them. No one seemed to have them anymore. It was driving me berserk. It was I was bad. texting you I'm like I've got to have these right stupid I, sexy candy, candy man. <laughs> because I really wanted to watch the rest of it while eating this guy's head. Oh. That's is that weird. weird? Is that perverted? Do you need to unpack that? Maybe. I'm probably not. <laughs> yeah, probably best not to. Anyway, um, I was disappointed because everyone now has this soft, like, Australian licorice, but they don't oh, have, which like... Which is kind of a cop-out. Yeah. yeah, but they don't have, like, the original Bassett's all sorts. Which are kind of the, hard. It's a little bit disgusting. They're a little... Like a little bit. Not like a lot, okay? <laughs> they're kinda, I like them, but they're, they're kind of... They're a little disgusting. They're kind of dry and crumbly. Yeah. And yeah. so kind of pasty yeah. and sort of like, it's a bit like eating mushy peas, you know, sometimes. Oh, some of the textures are kind of... Like yeah. Things. And gritty, maybe. The def- yeah. Some of them are definitely gritty. Yeah. Yeah. So maybe it doesn't appeal to everyone, but I used to love these. Yeah, and, no, I'm into it. And I developed this intense craving. But then, so, but then, you know, like I couldn't get them that night and I kind of like, oh, never mind. Never mind. Yeah. But Grace did find some at a Walgreens, but they weren't quite the they same. They weren't Bassett's, yeah. Yeah, and then last night when we were out, we actually did find a place that sold a very close version of the of that. Yeah. But uh, I, I was no longer the fe- moment it passed, feeling it. Yeah, you feeling it. Yeah, you had that sort yeah. of. You had the consumer fever. So the fan, the fan edit mm-hmm. was a little better. It was in black and white. They that's that's an interesting choice. They take this show that's full of lurid colors, right? Um, set against a very noir backdrop Mm -hmm. and they just made the whole thing black and white right which obscured some of the um, cheapness or the just the sameness of the set and the lack of depth right yeah and that improved it in many ways it made it almost like a noir film Mm -hmm. you know like a classic noir film right but Mm -hmm. then the candy man was black and white White. too which wasn't very much fun. and the and the wigs of the happiness patrol yeah those those are gone didn't show yeah. up and they no longer like the the strawberry fondant was gray was, yeah and when that they painted the tardis gone. pink it was gray oh i didn't even know i didn't even realize they painted the tardis pink yeah in the opening when the tardis shows up the doctor leaves and the happiness p- patrol comes and paints the tardis pink and then when he gets back he's like what? what? <laughs> well, that's yeah. No, the the um, the only thing the Candyman had going for him was his bright colors. Actually, that was that was a lot of it. Yeah. Yeah. So that that's all he had going for him in this really? setting. Yeah. I think you can reimagine him actually as this sort of menacing, almost Joker like character. Right? Yeah. Yeah. And he could be very effective. Right. If he's not actually made out of candy. But made out of candy, he didn't register in black and white right he didn't register and that was actually all that was there so my my idea of what the fan edit could have done although this would be very difficult right um and probably not something a typical fan would be able to do on his home computer and Mm -hmm. this is more like something the bbc would do right is you could make the whole thing black and white yes with the exception of certain characters and certain objects but that requires a lot of motion tracking yeah. and computer you know cgi and like it's it's costly mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and you'd want to start with the best uh video or film elements available mm-hmm. or even reshoot it for the love of god yeah, you it, know it could be it could stand to be reshot so i mean <clears throat> this is one of those shows that i think honestly could stand for a modern remake of of that of that show of As, that show right like you would rewrite the script yeah, you'd punch it up. You'd get some. Yeah. Well, you'd rewrite. Some I, I think writers. you'd make it much shorter. Short. It could it. be one show. 
It could be. Well, that, that's kind of the thing about the modern reboot is instead of four 25-minute parts, you oh, have one 40-minute. One 40-minute, one 44-minute thing. Yeah. And, and really, the Candyman That Man often story, works a lot Right, better. the Happiness Patrol really could be one 44-minute thing yeah. and be very good and tell, yeah. um, because that's the thing. It's still unclear to me what the story was. Yeah, it's not. Um, it's it's the, the it's the touching love story between Margaret Thatcher and one of her little one of her little dogs. Uh, yeah. Oh, okay. I mean, that's one aspect of it that I shows guess. up. Yeah, the, I don't know. Uh, yeah. So, so you you'd figure out what the story was. What story are we actually telling? Well, this is the story we're actually telling. Got to tighten it up a lot. Um, really get someone in to work on the dialogue, and then. But and you know the set doesn't actually have to be fancy. It doesn't even have to be good. They could stage this in a warehouse in Saginaw. Yeah, and it would be fine. Yeah. Okay, they, they could do the indoor for you know right. cityscape. Well, yeah, they, they could do this sort of indoor cityscape, sort of like a Mad Max thing. Or it looks like a play. Right. Yeah. It, it's it could be fine. Um, and uh, <coughs> but I think if you have decent dialogue, you have a good story. Um, I think you're there because it does have these really good elements. Of um, of a, sort of an anti-state theme, and it has these really good elements with the with the Candyman, and with this um, you know state repression, right? Yeah, that's all there. Those are some good ideas. They could put they could put a good piece together. Well, I, being I, the, B- I the think BBC so. could it yeah. could be a lot better. And you know, it's just okay. So our general impression. I mean, these aren't. We've watched a few more, and we're continuing to watch some of these fan edits. Mm-hmm. And the, that's the. It's like this. This thing about the old Doctor Who is still there, which is, wow, this is really bad for most of them. For most of them, it's just bad. Most of them are not very good. Yeah. And even the ones that have good elements, you have to sit through so an much. awful lot so of much show trash just to get to the good elements. To see the good elements. And then, like, you got to make notes so you can remember it. Yeah. <laughs> We, we watched one called Battlefield that was fun because it had all these battle sequences with the knights and the Arthurian. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, we watched, we've watched a few more. I'm not going right. to go into them all, but some of them are more fun than others. Some mm-hmm. of them have more snappy dialogue, but even the Largely. ones... Even the ones where there are some, there's some genuinely funny scenes right. or genuinely thrilling action scenes, you're, you're wading, wading through it. so much. So much to get there so if you are going to watch them i highly recommend by all means just dig up the fan edits. dig up the fan edits and watch those right don't, because literally seriously don't life waste is too short, Life's too short to slog through these four seven eight fourteen episode <laughs> you know serials that, just dragging i mean yeah. look, maybe maybe if you're getting paid maybe it's worth it but even then seriously consider your life choices if you're yeah, getting paid yeah, for right. watching dr who <laughs> I mean, just yeah, yeah. And there is there is so much mm-hmm. that uh, I, I I don't actually have the numbers off the top of my head. But the mm-hmm. folks that were writing these books, they took like two years to watch the the whole oh. thing. Oh, that that one the uh, the running, running through, through quarters, quarters books. books. Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. gosh. Yeah, and I years. think it caused the end of this guy's marriage. That's two years you'll never get back. <laughs> and they were so they like arranged to watch oh. two. A day, every day. This was for, a husband-wife team. No, it, it was uh, two guys, but one of them got married. But they were continuing to press on and uh, right. and do these reviews, right? Watching two episodes a day for two years. Good God! And I and we're still waiting for the third book. So that's wow. <laughs> anyway. And so the, anyway, that's that's, that's Doctor Who. Yeah, we have really enjoyed some of the some of the the modern Doctor Who's. Some of yeah. some individual shows are have wonderful. been really good. Yeah, just, just like mind blowing good. Oh, seriously! If you can watch nothing else, uh-huh. get yourself a copy of Blink. Blink. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. That's that's one to write home about. But trying to like watching that, and then you you get enthused, and you're like, well, let's go back and watch, you know. Oh, the source material. Let's go back and watch the um, oh, Doctor. The Trial of a Time Lord or what? And you, no, you're gonna put it. You're gonna eat a gun. No, honestly. seriously, don't do it. It's not worth it. <laughs> Save yourself. yourself. Save yourself. Just turn off the DVD. Yeah, player. yeah, okay. Yeah. So that's Doctor Who. That's what we've been watching. But we've been eating too. We've been eating too. Yeah. So I've had this. We we try and feed our kids the healthiest food we can. We try and feed them a, 
you know, do the, do the best we can as parents. Mm -hmm. Well, one thing I've wanted to do, I've been leaning towards recently is um, let's go back to uh, some more um, plant protein based dinners mm. and let's uh, reduce our animal protein a little bit. I years ago I I used to love to cook Indian food. Yeah, that was and good times, babe. We've had a few big feasts mm -hmm. where I would like get real ambitious and <clears throat> and cook with some help, like yeah. seven dishes. Oh, we you made know? that huge feast for my parents. That was, yeah, that was with so curries good. and greens. Well, my father and, was there. That was more than ten years ago. It's been a while. Yeah. Oh my goodness. But they enjoyed it, and I was yeah. gratified to have them enjoy some of this because of of like the national cuisines that i can actually cook mm -hmm. uh indian food is the one i enjoy cooking the most it's yeah. the most fun i think yeah uh it's labor intensive to cook these dishes Kinda. in the traditional way yeah, yeah. like to brown fry onions all minutes. the way to the 40 <sighs> minutes don't let anyone lie to you it takes a long time and people time. will lie to you Recipes frequently lie. No, it takes forty minutes. Yeah, and there's just okay. a there's just a lot of hand prep. Yeah, there's a lot. Of Especially if you yeah. do it right and you make your garam masala by roasting the spices yourself and grinding and it. grinding them. Yeah. It's just it takes time. Right. It's worth. It's it. worth it. It takes time. So we took some time this afternoon. We took some time this afternoon. We made a dish. I I got a version of a recipe for chana masala. Yeah. Which is chickpea curry. Yeah. Um, to to put it simply, yes, yeah, it's just chickpea curry. Um, from uh, the version of the that I used was not from Classical Indian Cooking by Julie Sani. It was from. Uh, yeah. Although we should check her recipe. Yeah, no, this was from the Guardian. Grace is blowing her nose. She's, hey. she's not. She'd like you to not know that. She's being very discreet. <coughs> Thank you. <laughs> so, I'm still coughing. We know. Yeah, yeah. I try to. Anyway, we're we're we all have our human frailties. Indeed. The Indeed, meal. Classic the Indian meal. cooking. Yes. yes. So we, we, we. I'm trying this recipe from the Guardian. The Guardian. Yeah, I, I thought it was pretty good. It was pretty good. Yeah. So in our in our outing last night, when we finally managed to get out of the driveway, <laughs> and leave we went the to house, Mass. Yeah. We went to Mass. We went to Bombay Groceries on Grocer on Packard. Yeah. And picked up some uh, some uh, papadums, which I love to roast to taste, Those are so tasty. and then um, some uh, some spices that we were mm -hmm. lacking. I, we, actually, we had most of them in the house. We had we had most of them. We needed a few things. I didn't have any fresh uh, cumin Garm. seeds. We, no, we didn't have any cumin seeds, and we actually I think we're out, we were out of garam masala. We were out. Of, well, yeah, we didn't have any of our own of our of our uh, homemade Almost, right. anymore. It would have been pretty stale by yeah, now anyway, so we had to get sad. some pre-made. Mm -hmm. But so we didn't make our masala from scratch, but we uh, we did the rest of it from scratch. Yeah, and we also had uh, some Indian desserts that I picked up frozen, including one of the uh, ones that has silver foil on it. Yeah, that was beautiful. Silver which leaf. Was really pretty. They, I just wanted the kids to have the experience, experience of, of eating all this. These lovely, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, well, they are lovely. They're so yes. good. I especially like the I love the ones with the rose water. Rose water and pistachios and cashews, these mm -hmm. little nuts nut like nut paste sweets that are mm -hmm. brightly colored and whatnot. I, I love that stuff. Yeah. Um so that was our, our dinner. That was our dinner. And and actually I don't think it's that much work. It's really all about mise en place and having, having everything set. Yeah, you want to have all your spices pre measured. All your ingredients chopped and chopped and ready to go. Like I, I didn't chop the onions as finely as I probably yeah. should have. Um, and if it, you do that, out, but yeah, yeah, if you do that, the actual cooking time for this dish it's not that long. Is not that long. No. I mean, it's not like one of the, it's not like the meat curry where you have to cook it twice and then no. simmer for actually and two if, hours. And if you on those, if you actually try to cut the cooking time, you can eat it, but it's just it's not, it's not the same. same. It's not. You the hit same. a certain. Uh, cooking time on those and the sauce just goes yeah turns into this just velvety smooth thing Luscious. that's just yeah that's just beautiful and if you cut it short you can still eat it but it's not that like transcendent yeah, quality like, yeah, yeah just, where it all blends it's all like you can feel it in your head you know? <laughs> <laughs> it's like oh yeah anyway I'll, I'll put a link to the recipe because this came out it was really quite tasty I, I had a little bit of a problem because we were actually using the, the scale and i got a little uh, 
OCD? Well, I, I don't want to. I, I don't want to hijack anyone's actual mental illness, but but I had <laughs> a problem. You were getting a little bit obsessive about trying to get the right number of well, that's grams. What's that? Twenty-five grams. It's twenty-five grams. Yeah, we have to have twenty-five. And like, it doesn't matter. It doesn't have to be exact. Well, you know, it was really. I really had a hard time with the chickpeas, where you were like a hundred grams over. I'm like, yeah, one can was way too little, and two cans was way, way too, too much. much. So, right, but I, 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 the, the, I managed. You pulled it together. I pulled it together. It was okay. Did some deep breathing. Yep. Yeah. So, you know, if you have that kind of problem, um, just beware. There are these measurements in grams, and you're going to pull out your kitchen scale. Just, just know that's coming. Yeah. Uh, and also, um, if you're following a recipe from a British uh, magazine or newspaper, <laughs> everything's going to say grams. Yes. Grams and... Um, well, but they still use teaspoons still and tips. Spe- it's very right. confusing. It's very confusing. So but you got to be prepared to juggle back and forth between, between that, right? milliliters rather than ounces, okay. grams, grams and and teaspoons and teaspoons and tablespoons. So, so yeah, that was. It's really bit- this mix. It's this unholy mix between these three different measurement systems. Yeah, yeah. Although I have to say, I do favor weighing for baking. Sure, for baking. Less so for cooking, but baking yeah, actually is really yeah. makes a difference. The the exact ratio of the different spices and whatnot is not is not actually yeah, important. Yeah, then, yeah, like it said, six cloves of garlic. I think I put in a head. You know. To, yeah, if you, I mean, you, I guess the idea is you don't want any one ingredient to to blow the rest of them out of the water that's as true. far as right, dominating. Yeah, balance. But I mean, you can be the judge of that. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So. So yeah, this was fantastic. <clears throat> Very good recipe. Even our food hater loved it. Yeah, I was so it called for a bunch of green chilies with seeds just thrown in to simmer. Yeah, and um, we didn't do that. We, we used a little bit of your green chili like, so, uh, paste sauce. Right. Yeah, I have, I have a green chili sauce I make that w- was left over from this um, summer, and that was good. Yeah, it was and it right. wasn't that hot. Nope. But you know, one kid was like, "This is too hot." Oh, this is but spicy. But to to my delight, almost everyone just scarfed it down scarfed and loved it, right it. Down. even the baby, even the baby, even though it's spicy. <laughs> she was like her face was turning pink, and she's like a little bead of sweat on her nose, but she's like, "No, give me some more <laughs> that's good i I'm proud of I'm proud of her. she's a good baby, yeah, okay, yeah, so yeah, we got two articles this week. We've got two articles. This is going to be really short. Yeah, we're just going to cut it close for you guys. Because we have nothing to talk about. Yeah. So, American Collapse. Umer Hake. That's our friend Umer. Yeah, we we did a bit by him before. Yeah. Um, Yeah, It was a good one. So, yeah. You want to introduce this one. So, he talks about, like, we've got these strange new pathologies uh, in the world's first rich failed state, and, and I, I gotta say, just just straight up, I, I think it's fair to describe the United States as a failed state, and that it has been. For, and let me just be clear, it has been for a very long time. How long? I I want to say thirty years. I think it's been failing since about seventy three. Yeah, well, no, okay. Seventy four. I would say that the, I think it actually was failed at the end of the 80s. Yeah. I think, I, I think the state had failed at the end of the 80s. By the end of the Reagan administration, the state yeah. had, had collapsed. We've just had a really persuasive veneer. Yes. Okay. But this has been the case for a long time. So I'm. Where this the, is not the, me whaling about... Um, uh, or the current administration. This is right. This is no. how it's been. It's it's not all about the current administration. No, no, the current administration is just really really bad at using their inside voice. That's all. Yeah. At at giving, like you say, the veneer of mm-hmm. of control and polish and professionalism. Right. Yeah. So he, he, this is. I'll, I'll read a little little piece. First of all, he says, you know, he doesn't think we're taking the collapse situation seriously enough, like at all, like even by any measure, is right. being serious about it. Um, yeah, we've got can these. I, can I can I read it? Oh, go bit go ahead, more. go ahead. Whatever numbers we use to represent decline, shrinking real incomes, inequality, and so on, we are in fact grossly underestimating what pundits call the human toll, 
but which sensible human beings like you and I should simply think of as the overwhelming despair, rage, and anxiety of living in a collapsing society. Yeah. And that's what he talks about. These, not even the, these pathologies we have, it's not just troubling and worrying and dangerous. They're bizarre. They are bizarre, and they, they seem almost unique to, to have this supposedly incredibly wealthy first world state. It's just this is happening. With, just happening. with these things happening. And I'm so so us- number one, America's had 11 uh, school <laughs> shootings in the last 23 days. That's one every other day, more or less. And the statistic is alarming enough, but it's just a number. Put that on the way. America's had 11 school shootings in the last 23 days, which is more than anywhere else in the world, even Afghanistan or Iraq. Yeah, the the mention of Afghanistan seems particularly troubling. We think of that as a oh as a hellscape. It's just a hellscape. Well, have we got a hellscape yeah. for you? And, and of course, Iraq. You know, we know it's a hellscape because we made it, we that, made it way. that way. Well, we made Afghanistan that way too, but that's another yeah. story for the time. Yeah. Uh, in fact, the phenomenon of regular school shootings appears to be a unique feature of American collapse. It's just not happening in any other country, and that's what he means by social pathologies of collapse. Mm-hmm. Um, then there's the opioid epidemic. Let me use that phrase casually. Um, it's more troubling than it appears on first glance. It's what's really curious about it. Many countries, particularly in Asia, because it looks pretty troubling at first glance. So. Yeah, uh, you can buy all the opioids you want over the counter without prescription. Uh, but people don't, aren't dying of them. No, they're not. They're not <coughs> going to this. To, you know, anywhere near this. Nothing like degree. this. It's yeah. not. An, it's not an epidemic. It's not yeah. a. You know. It's not really a thing. Uh, we don't see opioid epidemics anywhere but America, especially ones not so vicious and widespread. They actually shrink life expectancy. Yeah, that's been a, a shocking revelation. That, and so that American life expectancy is shrinking declining due to opioid abuse. That's, that's a large part of it. Now, why would people abuse opioids en masse, unlike anywhere else in the world? They must be living genuinely traumatic and desperate lives. Yeah. No, I I believe it's true, and it's yeah, um, it's you know it's largely it's not just a phenomenon of the working class, no, no, of the it's working not. class, but it is largely happening there. Well, it, they're taking the brunt of it, and right. we're, we're not talking to them. No, no, no. Another example: nomadic retirees, quote unquote. They live in their cars, go from place to place, season after season, chasing whatever low wage work they can find. And poor people have always chased jobs, but that's not yeah. really the point. For for many, well, not many, but for a number of decades, things were better for American retirees in that yeah, in that there could exist people we could call retirees, right? right who are actually retired from they actually working. retired from work. Like yeah, I mean these, these folks aren't <laughs> retired. No, <laughs> they're just um, how shall I say? Um, Downwardly and mobile. <laughs> not even that. Like they're like they're they're homeless. They're like they're like traveling homeless people. Yeah, there there's a documentary about this that that uh, with jobs. They're where, traveling homeless people with jobs. People travel around in their RVs and they go to seasonally to work in Amazon warehouses. Yeah, and they live in parking lots provided for this. Oh, isn't kind that of thing. nice? It's they, they, make, they provide them with parking lots. Do they have clean showers and bathrooms too? It's really worrying, I have to say, because I've done my best to try and put away money for retirement and hoped that I would one day, and maybe not even that long, long from now, now, be able to retire. But it's not its not feeling mm-hmm. like that. Yeah, My money now, a large portion of it is going to real estate that I can't get out from under. Or live in. <laughs> or live in. Yeah. One of the two would be nice. Yeah. And we still have to resolve that. But mm-hmm. I have a very good job now, but I just have the sense that no job that I'm ever going to have in my career is going to have the kind of security, security and staying power that exists existed for mm-hmm. a previous generation. You keep talking for a moment. I'm checking on the recording. Yeah. Oh, sure. So uh, his last last pathology he speaks of is just a fundamentally predatory society. A predatory society doesn't just mean oligarchs ripping off people financially. In a true way, it's the people themselves. It's the society itself that just nod and smile along 
as the as everyone around them, their neighbors, their friends, their colleagues, die early deaths, and are buried in shallow graves. Yeah, like it's happening all around you all the time, and you just don't seem to notice or care. It's not, you know. It's it's he's talking about how we have basically become, normalized this. We've normalized this flattening of empathy. Well, yeah. Well, like, like so. We, we've got some reason to otherize the people dying of opioid deaths. There, there's always some reason. We've got some, some reason. reason to otherize the people who yeah. are chasing jobs at Amazon. There's always won't some Amazon reason. Be great this, for our this person and, didn't yeah. didn't take out enough student loans to pursue education hard enough. This person didn't work or hard whatever. enough. This yeah. person didn't. You know, this person used uh, drugs once or what? And, and actually, frankly, we we've got we're completely paralyzed on school shootings, yeah. and people are basically just. They just different. They no. just if if they do talk about it, I've stopped talking about shootings. Yeah, there's nothing to talk about. Anymore. There's nothing to talk about. No, because all if I do try and argue with people, all they'll do is just you know it's no, like no, no. it's like pulling the string on a Barbie. You just hear the stock phrases come out right, again. Just, there's just nothing to say, and then I don't have a new argument for no. them that's going to somehow <laughs> convince them. Children shouldn't be dying at school. <laughs> It's not new. That's a new, like, right? Or how it's, just, like, like, it's, like, it's like liberals imagine, oh, once the body count reaches a certain amount, people will, their hearts will be softened, you know, they'll like be, oh, you know what, you're right. But they, no. that's the thing. This could happen to their own family. And they'd be they could lose half their family and they would find some reason that it wasn't about the guns, you know. Or any, or any number of things, right? Uh, yeah. So. Although I, I although I maybe I do have a new take. We should save this for an episode about okay. about school. Shootings. Maybe we can do one. Yeah, because I've been thinking about this a lot actually. We have a take on school shootings. I think I do. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But no, I and actually we'll do was, a hot take episode. We haven't done one of those. No in freak a while. take. I want to do a freak take episode. But you know, I suppose <laughs> we can do a hot take if we just wait for another shooting. <laughs> to the current. Well, then we yeah. <laughs> to the current crisis in the Middle East. Yeah, that, that so um, Noam Chomsky mentioned that you know he schedules talks like like, like a year or more in advance, like four years in advance. Four years in advance, right. sometimes right. to to talk, give a talk at a at a university or something. Right. And the the to, the um the talk scheduled four year in advance. The title is the current, the current crisis, crisis in, in the, the Middle, Middle East. East. <laughs> And he's quite confident that he's not going to arrive four years later and <laughs> have, no have nothing to, to say. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So there's that joke. Yeah. Yeah. So this this last pathologist no, is one of indifference. No, I right? joke. I, I I joke, but it's like you know, Every whistling in the dark and, uh, on on Twitter. Oh, today's shooting. Today's you know, shooting. Like. Yeah. Oh. So, what does he say here? Um, the predator in American society isn't just a super rich, but an invisible and insatiable force. The normalization of what in the rest of the world would be seen as shameful, historic, generational moral failures, if not crimes, becoming mere Monday everyday affairs not to be too worried by or troubled about. And these, yeah, yeah. I'm giving you a few examples. Yeah. The social pathologist, <laughs> share with you three points that they raised for him. Okay. Um, American collapse is much more severe than we suppose it is. Yeah. We are underestimating its magnitude, not overestimating it. American intellectuals, media, and thought doesn't put any of its problems in global or historical perspective. Right, right. But when you see them that way, America's problems are revealed to be not just the everyday nuisances of a declining nation, but something more like a bodily a body suddenly attacked by unimagined diseases. Yeah. Like, and really, for for me, that sort of wake up call. Um, was actually the 2000 election, right? And it's right. and it's kind of what's the word, um, a little more prosaic than, not so much because I was shocked. Talking about the 2000 election now seems like what are you talking? About? No, the 2000 election. So every, right. everyone remembers this. Yeah. But here's what here's what I remember, and what I was shocked by. I wasn't shocked that Al Gore lost because I didn't. I thought to myself, Al he Gore wasn't, wasn't a winner. He wasn't getting uh, traction. Well, yes and no, but I will tell you. What shocked me? Okay, I remember in my high school um, Western civilization class discussing American politics, and um, my teacher, uh, <laughs> Mr. Croft, thoughtful, yeah. well-educated man, yeah, said, "You know, there's an interesting thing you should note that during peacetime, yeah, and an economic boom, 
whoever's in power gets reelected. Period. Well, almost always. No, always. Well, okay, historically. Uh, yes. So, so frequently, historically, that's a, a rule. It's a rule. And I was like, oh, right. And I frequently used that to guess on exams, right? I was like, what's going on? Oh, and I could guess the answer even if I hadn't done the reading, right? Right, right. It's, kind of, it's a little bit of an axiom. And um, no, it's fascinating to me. Because of that axiom, I was kind of like, you know, Gorb really sucks. He's not getting any traction. But, you know, he's going to win because it's peace time. Right. We are in an economic boom. People loved Clinton. People loved Clinton. So, you know, he's going to win, even though he sucks, Yeah. even though he's not getting any traction, even though his own state isn't interested in him. We had a surplus. Yeah, we're gonna, he's going to win. He and I didn't really think about it. Relatively good shape. Not structurally, yeah. but not structurally. financially. But, but like at the moment of the election, the numbers, yeah. everyone the numbers was having a good, good time. The yeah. numbers were good. So I was really taken by surprise. And that was the moment for that reason. This was an historical anomaly. Yes. Yeah. So that's why it stuck with me as something very interesting. And you realized this was evidence of collapse. This was evidence of collapse. And that was the moment when I could look back and see like the structure of it sort of, of the revealed collapse. of the collapse. Yeah. But um so that was 18 years ago. And uh what what can I say even? Yeah, I so this is what's interesting. I was looking at Gore and knew that he was a terrible candidate and wasn't winning the election. And I was still expecting him to win the election. Right. He because, wasn't winning in the sense of people people weren't loving him. Right. He didn't he didn't attract much in the way of passion rallies. And as you see, if you look at twenty sixteen, people are looking at Hillary Clinton. They know she sucks. They know she's not winning. Right. And yet they still expected her to win. Right. The same way. In the same way. Right. In the same sort of like, well, I'm sure she'll win because what else could happen? Yeah. Right? People weren't turning out for, for Clinton right. rallies. They were, and, and we could see that. We could look. In the way that they were turning out for Sanders Sanders, rallies. or even Trump, for God's sake. Or Trump rallies. Right? But yeah, the, we're, the, we're looking at it. Right. We're, we're watching it. Right. We see it in front of us. And we're like, oh, but I'm sure she'll win. Right. Right? And that was the game I played with myself in 2000 with Al Gore. Yes. And not even that I wanted Gore to win. I wasn't voting for Gore in 2000. Just so anyone knows. I've, yeah. Yeah. I've never heard right. that. Um, yeah, it's. it was more about I kind of resigned myself to his win in spite of everything I'm looking at. Yes. And I think that's the very real thing we have. We are looking at it right now. We're looking at our neighbors being drug out of their homes. Yes. And we don't see it. We don't see it. Right? So, like, the only time I've seen these stories in my news feed or on the media that I follow about all these deportations... <clears throat> Is since two thousand since January twentieth, two thousand seventeen. That's when I started seeing media about the deportations. Yes. Catholic workers have been hiding deportees in their homes since two thousand three. Yes. Okay. I mean, it's this is been happening. It's been happening. It's not new. It's, and not, it's not new because of Trump. Yeah. This this isn't like some horrible thing that's descended on us. Right. It's been happening in front of us. It's crept up gradually. Just you know, yes. for a long time now, decades. For a long now. time. So that's <clears throat> that's a real thing that I think we have to somehow push ourselves past. We're seeing not, it, and not if seeing we can't it. see it on, if we can't talk about it honestly and in, in an accurate historical context, we can't we can't right. believe what we're seeing. What we're seeing, right? What we're seeing now, if we think it's just some new anomaly, right? And, and you have to because we will downplay it in every way. In every way, and you have to understand this is the <clears throat> metaphor he uses. This is this is like the meteor that hit the dinosaurs. Yes, it, it's something different than what you've seen or experienced, or what your grandparents have seen or experienced. Yeah, it's not the Great Depression. It's not the you know. Yeah, they, we don't have a cultural frame of reference. It's not the Civil War. <laughs> so you know you don't. So people keep talking about the Civil War. People keep talking about the recession of two thousand eight, and the quote recovery yes and and so on um we're looking at something quite different and what we're looking at and living in now is a is a country that had collapsed 30 years ago and we're just now figuring it out it's what well, when you describe sears didn't they like go out of business a decade ago yeah people just kept they showing just up for had, work people just kept showing up it's like they haven't noticed that they're out of business but right. it's still it was you go into a sears anytime in the last decade okay. it's felt like it was out of business yeah it's like you're 
Yeah, yeah. It's, it's not in business. Yeah, you got to find some dazed retiree, maybe living in a camper. <laughs> you get a camper in the parking lot. Um, to, to try and sell you something. And you got to kind yeah. of beg them and, and tell them what's please, on sale. You know, you know. That's, a, that's a sale item. Yeah. Explain how the register works. Yeah. No, it's it's been yeah. it's been ter- a mess. It's been a, it's been a mess. In the United States, it's been a real mess. Amazing that they managed to to keep their doors open, but yeah. they've only done it at a constant loss. Constant loss. So that's the United States has been in this position for a long time. Yep, it's been and hem- that's where we are. Hemorrhaging everything. Everything, and so now the hemorrhaging has gone so far, you can't help but notice some of these things coming unraveled. Yep, but um, we're in deep, and. I think the really sad news about it, and this is this is me, and this is not a mayor. Um, the really sad news is I don't think there's um, there's no going back. It's never going to be the country that we imagine and hope that it can be. Yeah, there's, there's no going back. It will be a country. <laughs> I mean, I I mean I don't think like the physical landmass of the Americas is going to like dissolve. Sink into the into the continental basin. If we're lucky California might. <clears throat> yeah. Hopefully everyone will be able to leave first, but you know, yeah. I think California might just go away. But you know, that's just me. This is which thing in my part. So, the um um but no, the the Burned land mass fell over then fell into the swamp or something. Yeah. Something. The um but no, I I don't think there's any going back to whatever Camelot you imagine there was. Yeah. Or, or that anyone imagines there was. Um, but I am hopeful, though. I, I really hope fervently for um, a good future. It's, uh, I think of this a lot, as you might imagine. <laughs> and especially think of it in terms of how do we talk to our kids about the future that we're planning and expecting for them? Yeah. And that's a big topic for it. Really is. Oh, wait, but, we should do a topic on that. Yeah. Yeah, but I do try to be honest with them that uh, you know that I I believe their economic lives are going to be difficult, and the 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 um, the systems that you and I have mostly been able to rely on for even things like you know. The grocery stores always have food on the shelves. Yeah, that guy could be different. We're trying to get them prepared f- for, something for, different. for something different. What we're and not, to be honest, what I'm not precisely sure. Yeah, but something it'll be different somehow. But you know, I remain optimistic in the sense that I believe that um, we can build local. We can reverse entropy locally. Mm-hmm. <laughs> We can mm-hmm. build local solutions that actually help people, even in actually the face help people of, help each other of very uh, in, of a collapsed sort of concept of the larger state, especially the, the right. federal. Yeah, I'm government. Y- yeah, I, I'm I'm not a big fan of the state, as I've said before. Right. Um, and so we'll we'll work around it. Yeah, we'll work around it. We'll, we'll keep functioning in spite of it. Yeah. Yeah. So All right. We got a second piece here. We got um, a second piece. Uh, this accurate. is a bit of an unusual choice for us, but yeah, uh, but uh, but I felt it was it was it was right. It was good. Um, actor John Mahoney passed away. Um, I believe in the last week recently. Yeah. He was born in 1940, lived in 2018, and um, he played the dad in, in Frasier. In Frasier, which I, is a show that I honestly didn't watch all that much. I think that's his most famous role. But when I did see him in it, I always was impressed by how he was basically a, a funny character who was uncompromisingly kind of a bit mean. Kind of a prick. He was His character was a bit mean, but people loved him anyway. Mm-hmm. And they didn't make him a schmaltzy sugar-coated no dad character no i think no i think that was really conscious because he was a counterpoint to these urbane intellectuals that his sons became. absolutely right he he was a foil to them right where they're all you know me, me, oh the, the merlot is not you know or whatever right <laughs> and he's like oh, <laughs> yeah mm-hmm yeah. Now, he he he, <clears throat> he thought they were stuck up their own butts, honestly. Right. And spoke to them spoke accordingly. To them accordingly. Um, 
So this is an obituary that uh, a neighbor of his from, uh, where is he? He's uh, from, he was living in Chicago, but outside Chicago, one of the um, suburbs, <coughs> Oak Park, Illinois. So an Archie historic suburb. They like to brag that it's Ernest Hemingway's birthplace. And um, now what's the, what's the rules on this? Can I read the obituary? Because this is not, what is, this is like being passed around on Facebook. I, this is not a, this is not, not enough. I'm not sure what it is, honestly. Yeah, so I'm not sure what it is. I'll link, so, I do have a link for it. Um, I think it was set to public on Facebook. Right. I don't think it's an obituary as in like this was written by a journalist and put in a paper. No, it's not. No, it's this a is personal a personal reminiscence by, right. by a neighbor. Right. right. So I don't read the whole thing. Uh, but. Okay. But she, so, so she knew him personally and, um, thought he was a good and kind person and such that when someone was mistreating her at the grocery store she stopped for a moment and thought to herself what would john mahoney do yes she she really she says uh he was truly the kindest man i knew mm, mm-hmm. or it, she, she, that's I a good guess, way to be remembered right. yeah it's a good way to be remembered we've been acquaintances for a number of years um this was written in i think before he passed away so it reads he is the kindest man i know right um but it's in yeah. present tense but uh, that might be slightly confusing oh you know there might yeah this i think it was written like the day of or the like within within days of his death yeah um yeah and what struck me about this obituary and gave me pause and the reason i didn't actually just pass it on even though i wanted to remember the actor fondly well a lot a lot of your friends were circulating it a lot of my catholic friends were circulating it was so inspiring but how inspiring it was he she talks about him advocating lying well first i i think should comment that he identified as a as a devout christian a devout uh, roman catholic a devout roman catholic yeah. and he mentions praying constantly and mm-hmm. almost as a mantra right um, talking about what um, his mantra is right uh, what's what's the kindest thing i can do what's the kindest thing i can do how can this i be situation kind? right and and he she quotes him as saying um if people like me it means i'm treating them well and it's sort of proof that i'm doing the right thing yes Okay. He tries to be charitable. He thinks that's and he thinks that's the greatest virtue. I was always taught that it's the greatest virtue, and I feel that. I try to be very loving to people, and I try to be very patient with people, which is my biggest <clears> thing. <throat> I'm a very impatient person. Person, I work constantly on that. He says he's not the, sure who to pray for, pray to for that. His his mantra: "Dear God, please help me to treat everybody, including myself, with love, respect, and dignity." Yeah. So. No, it, it's he, he says so many good things. He says a lot of good things. Yes. Yes. What what. Do you have a the line that kind of? I'm looking for the line that really triggered me because I was triggered. <laughs> yeah. Let me see if I can find it here. Yeah. Talk about oh, the importance um, of being kind. Charity it, is more, more important, important than telling the truth. Charity is more important. Than I think telling sometimes the, truth. the virtue is making sure you don't hurt anybody's feelings, as opposed to patting yourself on the back saying, "Oh well, I had to tell them the truth." He says as he begins to tell the story of a patient who was in the last days of her battle with cancer. Um, but just this, yeah. He he talks about um, this woman who uh, had cancer. She was she had cancer. And she was in terrible pain. She had gray hair and wanted to dye her hair red. She wanted to have her hair dyed red before she died. So the nurses did it for her, and she loved it. When her daughter showed up, um, her daughter she, thought it was horrifying. She thought she looked like a clown. And one of the nurses said, your mother's dying. That's what she wanted. Why are you so cruel? Why are you saying that to her? And the daughter said, well, I can't lie to her, can I? And he's like, yes, she could have, she could have lied to her. It would, would have been, been much more charitable to say, oh, how pretty, even if you had hated it. Yeah, and then he gives an example. If you go see your a play, play and someone's not very good in it, it's not their best work, I would never tell them that. Why? All you're doing is being proud. You're congratulating yourself, yourself for always, always being, being truthful. truthful. And... Yeah, and and you... It's just sometimes to love your neighbor, you have to tell a lie. And I don't and think that, there's anything wrong with that. And that I, I was rubbed just, up against your moral sense as... It really did. 
Yeah, and, I'm just, just sort and of I like. Th- and know. I think I'm pretty much with you on it. Bec- when I think about the story of the woman with the hair, what I think about is the daughter coming in and offering her opinion. Offering when it an wasn't unsolicited asked opinion. For. Right. right. I don't think her mother said, oh, what do you think of it? Uh, you know, and then she said, and then she said something mean. I think right. she came in saying mean things. Right. 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 And that's never. That's never called for. Especially not for your dying mother. No, no, it really isn't. That's not called for to create that kind of atmosphere. It's not valuable. It's, it's not, not valuable in the... Um, in the it's <laughs> not brave, you know? Right. And, and frankly, I, I have a lot of opinions, most of them unsolicited. Right. And um, this is this is my podcast, so I share them and you're free to not listen. Right. But um, and a lot of things that I think, I don't volunteer them to people because I know they might find it hurtful. And In real life... Um, if you do go to a play or something that your friends put on or something, mm-hmm. it's most likely no one's actually going to solicit your opinion of the play. Actively solicit your opinion, right? No. Yeah. yeah. And yeah, and, and then I think it's good advice to say. And so there's you know there's not any cause for you to be spouting out about how uh, saying something that might be hurtful. Right. Just as I say mean things. Right. And it's and so yes, I think it's critical to be kind. So. Yeah, and I frequently. I, um, I would be looking for something honest and kind to say. Like, it was really nice to see you. You know, to see you in this play. To see you in this play. I'm. Right. I'm really happy to see you're involved in this. You know, theater group or whatnot. It's pretty. It's cool. I like that. I appreciate right. that. I try often to live by what I say is everyone's mother's advice. That if you have nothing nice to say, you cannot say something. I spend a lot of my days every day not saying things. Just not saying things. <laughs> Just not saying the thing that's not nice because yes. you know i had that's the thing like we go to dinner parties you but if, were so quiet i had nothing nice to say but if your friend say was terrible in this play just terrible chewing the scenery you know forgot his lines just whatever a train wreck and corners you afterwards and saying oh what'd you think how was i good was i good in this play yeah i don't think you're doing him a kindness to lie to him you're not doing a kind him you're not really doing a great thing to make something up and lie. I mean, because uh, here's the thing. He's cornering you for your opinion, and he wants to know what you think. Yes. And, I, yeah. And, but but like, like I said, I don't think that actually happens very often. It's In my experience, it's rare. Because I think when this person finishes the play... They know. They know. They know. They're not confused. That this play wasn't great. But it doesn't matter. That's not the most important thing about why they were participating. No, it's not. He didn't, and that's not he the most important reason you were there. He didn't participate in the play to um, to create some kind of dramatic masterpiece that was going to be reviewed favorably in the New York Times theater section or whatnot. Not at his, you know, This woman yeah. didn't dye her hair because she was actually going, going to, to do a, a killer, photo, yeah, shoot photo shoot with Vogue the next morning. And wanted to be hot for it. You know? That's not what it what it happened. That's not what was she going was on. trying to cheer herself up facing her own death. Right. It's a different thing going on. It's a different need. It's a different thing. And she didn't oh, ask the daughter, Do I look pretty like this? And I was like I needs to say something like, I'm really glad you got a chance to die to, to I'm so glad you got a chance hair. to get your hair done. Yes. I know it meant a lot to you. I'm glad you got a chance to Yes. That I hope that's true, you know, <laughs> but just this larger thing, and you I do think look this like is a bit like that woman in in uh, the Happiness Patrol. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> it's a hot pink hair, but but that aside, you don't need to volunteer that. You don't need to volunteer that. You never need to volunteer that kind of information. And I think if someone's pressing you for it, at least for me, I know I'm quite certain people come to me, and when they press me for my opinion, it's because they want to know the truth. Yeah. And that's why they're asking me. They have confidence that you will be honest with them, possibly where other people would not at all. Right. So and, I, and, and I, I don't actually try to take pride in that. And that's something I, 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 I attempt not to take pride in that. But um, I value that deeply. Because if we can't be honest with each other. Right. I, I don't know. There's, there's more going on here. And yeah. I think of this as a really great example of a sort of liberal version of Christianity. Yes. And I'm not entirely comfortable with all of it. And here's no. here's another example. Right. Um, 
he talks about when he was moved to rededicate himself to his his faith. Yes. Uh, I've always prayed to the Holy Ghost for wisdom and for understanding and knowledge. I think he answered my prayers when I stopped in the church that day. My life was totally different from that day on. I saw myself as I was, and I saw into the future and saw what I wanted to be. And I sort of rededicated myself to God, and I begged him to make me a better person. It wasn't fear of hell or anything like that. I just somehow knew that to be like this, like what I was, wasn't the reason I was created. I had to be better. I had to be a better person. And I think I am now. I like myself, he says, breaking into one of those patented head back, eyes closed, mouth open laughs. <laughs> yeah. That is pride and smugness coming yeah. out. And it's not uh, as, you know, if anyone asked me, well, you know, are you a good Christian? I'd say, no, no. I'm a terrible Christian. Are you kidding me? <laughs> no. <sighs> what? Well, yeah, yeah. And, and then this, he yeah. says, I'm pretty much in a spiritual state most of the time. Even if when I'm out drinking with my friends and even when I drink too much, God's never far from my thoughts. But he's not a freak. I'm not a freak asking what would Jesus do and stuff like that. I don't think things like that. I don't pride myself on being able to do what he did anyway. We don't really know. I just try to live a good life. That's humble bragging. It is kind of a humble brag. And I'm... It, it's a very liberal vision of Christianity. Where you're just kind to people. Where you're just you're just a nice guy. Just a nice guy. And everyone likes you. You're a nice guy and everyone likes you. And that's what's important. That's That means you're saved. No. And I got to tell you, if you're not turning over tables, I don't know. It's not, you know, like when you ask yourself, what would Jesus do? You know, seriously, picking up a whip and chasing people out of the temple is not outside of the you know the, 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 the record. record no so i it's so that it just rubbed me the wrong way as a sort of happy um happy clappy <laughs> comfortable fun christianity yeah that you know if, so i just i, I, think, I think it's if, good for I him th- to be a nice person that's it's wonderful that he was a nice person <laughs> and, and i'm, by the, gl- I'm yeah. glad that he focused on making people like him and and as a result was so beloved and felt beloved by a lot of people right and everyone should have a community of love like that that everyone should that that's good and, and i don't mean to denigrate that or especially to really to really denigrate a dead man um we're not but, trying to den- denigrate a dead man we're talking so about, about why we're a little bit uncomfortable with this hagiography that's circulating among Catholics, among Catholics, as an example of a life well lived, a life a, a, Catholic, relig- a, a Catholic life well lived, lived, a religious life well lived, and this is not his his uh, understanding of how to live his life is actually a secular understanding. It's of, a secular. It, it, it's not a Catholic vision um, because the, the, yeah, dedicating yourself to the religious life, to the the to the gospel, to living the gospel is a struggle it's a struggle and it's not a warm bath it's kind of like just a cold shower it's like ice water down the back when you least expect it honestly right it's just not to be out in the world yeah and really believing in the catholic social teaching and the message of the gospel yeah is to be constantly challenged and constantly mortified right well and, and and if you're honest when pressed there will be people who don't like you. That, that's if, how it's going to be. If you're really doing the work of the social teaching and you're like really speaking with the prophetic voice of the Gospels, people you know, aren't going to like people that. People aren't going to like that. I mean, I'll, I'll just give you a little up-close personal example here in the Diocese of Lansing. So the diocese has decided that... Um, if students kneel for the anthem, if they're football players, kneel for the national anthem, or don't, this is another little thing, or don't stand up for the Pledge of Allegiance, 
they'll like miss a game or they'll be expelled from school and you know, there's like a, sort of like a levels of which of uh, discipline so like the first infraction they have to go home for the day the next infraction they go home for the week third infraction like they get expelled right and um and there's a small number of parents who are like well i'm not giving the diocese any money as long as this is the deal right <laughs> F that, right? Yeah. But the reason they have this policy, the reason the diocese has this policy is because the vast majority of white Catholics are white supremacists. Yes. And I don't mean like, they don't wear Klan hoods. My God, no. Not not in a big public obvious way. None of them. I will bet you money. Not one of them has ever spoken the N-word in his or her life. Yeah. Bet you money. It's not the same. No, no, no. That's not what we're talking about. It's not what I'm talking about. Yeah. What I'm talking about is they would, if the diocese allowed players to kneel, they would stop giving money. Yes. And there's far more of them that the parents will stop giving money. Yes. If they force the players to, to stand. Right. Right. So the parents who are not giving money are the ones that no one likes. Those are the people that are like outcasts now yes. for speaking to the paper and not giving money yes. because, you know, their kids would like to kneel for the, their kids would like to kneel and pray during the anthem. Right. And the church doesn't want them to. The church. Doesn't want them to pray for justice. The church calls them to kneel and refuse to bow before Caesar. So, actually, right? So it's those children and their parents and the people who support them, um, they're not making any friends doing this. No. They're not being kind to do this, except it's the ultimate kindness of being honest about yes. the church and what's happening here. Right. That they've got, to ex- they've got to express honestly what they see in front of them. Yes. That if they're just go along to get along in right. this situation, they're yeah. being dishonest in a very fundamental way. This is a bigger topic than, than poor John Mahoney, right? This is Absolutely. Not, it's not really... We're not really... Not, we're not criticizing him. This is not about him. I found a clue at the end right. of this thing. It's not it about says him. says that it was actually written in July 2005. Oh, ages ago. And right. it was a profile written for a book, uh, The God Factor Inside the Spiritual Lives of Public People. Okay, yes. Published in so, 2006. So it, it wasn't. this wasn't even written and published in the context of, of his death. Of his death. And it was also, he talks about, uh, there's a little thing in here, there's a segment where he talks about the experience of having cancer in the 80s, yeah, in the late 80s. 30 years ago. And I will just say, I believe that will change a person. Will fundamentally change a person. Yeah. And so I I liked him as an actor, yes. and he sounds like a fine person. He's a fine person. And I don't mean to denigrate him in any way. This profile, though, I think is highlights an aspect of Christianity to us that that's feels- That's very pernicious. Pernicious, secular, and dishonest. And, dis- and dishonest. Yeah. And almost gleefully so. Yeah. Right? That yes, I'm doing that in the service of charity and kindness. When actually in charity and kindness, there are times that you have to speak the truth. And um, it's good. You don't that, need to beat people over the head with the gospel. No, 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 no. You don't need to do that. That's and you don't not, need to be, you don't need to volunteer unkind opinions. No. Or, you know, on thought, you know. Um, unpleasant opinions. Jesus hang, hung out with the lowest of the low. Yeah. The losers, the and life's losers. I don't think they hung out with him. And sanctified them. But I don't think they were hanging out with him because he was like beating them over the head. No. Right? No, no, no. That's not what I'm talking no, about at they all. they saw something. But they, yeah, they saw something. They felt something. They had a relationship that mattered, right? Right. right. Um, but this larger thing of being honest. Yes. Um, it, it's, it's an important thing to do. Even even when you get there's going to be these gray areas yes. where you've got to you know bite the bullet in some way. Yeah, but you can find some way to be kind I, without lying. I'm just I, I'm reminded of Kurt Vonnegut saying that you know one thing you've got to do is is you've got to be kind, mm-hmm. and I believe that's true. But yeah. I that doesn't I don't necessarily that entail lying to people. Who ask you? <laughs> who ask you for your, your opinion? opinion. Right. right? No, I don't think it does. Um, I'm going to plug my friend's book. Uh, Elizabeth Scalia has a book called uh, "Little Sins Mean a Lot," it, and she in it she describes you know when and I, this is actually something I talk about personally with the kids all the time. Maybe I can find a link to that. Oh, I th- I'm sure you can. Um, 
I, I think she has it on sale for Lent coming up. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to need this. Hey. Right. So it's absolutely critical that you practice the hard virtues when it doesn't matter. Oh, yeah. yeah. You have, so in other words, it's critical that you um, do the right thing, even when you're not sure it's like a big deal. There's, uh, yeah. Because practicing that will get you ready for. Will get you ready for when it is a big deal. Stand up for when it is a big. Deal. For when it's really a big deal yeah. and it really counts, you need the courage of your convictions to do it. Yeah. And, and you can't do it unless you've practiced. That's why the little sins mean a lot. Exactly. Okay. So and that so that's why this affected me so much to see this amongst Catholics as like a, a virtuous way to live Catholicism. Yeah. It's not. Um, it's just. It's just not. It, I don't think that compilation, the book that that was written right. for the stories, it was not. That was probably not a Catholic perspective. I don't think so. I, yeah. I really don't think so. Right. And, and and this is not to impugn him as a Catholic anyway. I'm sure he, he's probably was probably a much more edified Catholic than I've ever been. And I, I also probably did not come off the same way that she uh, that she quite the same way it was related. Chose to profile to profile it really so yeah. so yes um i wish i wish mahoney got speed on his journey i yes. understand his theater company uh canceled opening night to wake him at a pub um oh so he got a good cool. send off i'm hoping i'm hoping things are well for him yeah and i um, i always i have a great appreciation for character actors and and actors oh, yeah. who can go ahead and uh, you know, Carol O'Connor is my favorite example. Oh yeah, right? no, he was fantastic. Who can be on? Who who? There's. It seems to me that there's a great joy in playing unlovable characters. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, no, because he was just as great in the Heat of the Night. <clears throat> yes. As he was as Archie Bunker. Yes. Uh, I, yeah. Night, he, night and day. Night night and day. Rolls. Well, 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 actually, not entirely. Uh, in the Heat of the Night went through sort of like a character progression. Yeah. But we're very similar in some ways in their root character. But yeah, night and day uh, in terms of like comedy and drama and pathos. Yes. Right? Uh, and he was every bit as good in both roles. Yeah. Yeah, he was great too. And so, yeah, I, again, it's it's too uh, too bad that I don't know more of his work. In his oh, you saw work. him in Say Anything. Yeah. I, I don't remember. Oh, okay, yeah. No, it, 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 he, he was in a, a fair number of he, things. He's in a fair number of things. But yeah, people like mostly will remember him from Frasier. From Frasier, yeah. as recently. So. Yeah, well, no, it, it, was, it lasted 11 years. It was on every week. Yeah. A lot of people recognize his face. Yeah. That. Okay. Yeah. Then All I right. Think we're there, like I, I think said. we're there. Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah, for so next time we're going to. Um, we're going to have a colorized version of the Happiness Patrol Ooh. where. Uh, they still paint the TARDIS pink, and oh, all, yeah. the, all the patrol members have pink hair. Or lavender. Uh, the the execution scenes feature hot uh, hot, oh, hot fondant strawberry, oh, hot strawberry, strawberry candy, candy yeah. that's bright pink, where mm-hmm. everything else in the frame is black and white. When the candy man shows up, he's still garishly colored. Yeah. And then at the end, when they defeat the state. Mm-hmm. And this touching scene where this woman's dog dies. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> old Yeller. Old um, Yeller came at the end. Yeah. Um, then it will undergo a Wizard of Oz transformation and the world will... will the walls turn, will fall down uh, and the colors will come back on? The colors will come back to the world. Oh. That's that's what I think should happen. No, I think you're right. I see it. Anyway. Okay. All right. That's a wrap. We'll Thanks for listening, guys. everyone. Bye-bye. Bye.